NiceChowitzSpace.com. Um, I'm actually going to ask you some questions that our readers wanted to pose to you. Uh, so Jillian Finnerty was curious, um, in space when it's so often dark outside, does your internal body clock get confused? Uh, actually, it does not. Uh, what Your internal body clock seems to keep its own time. It has its own little uh, mechanism and and you wake up, quote, in our morning, which is uh, GMT time, and maybe it's uh, sunny outside, maybe it's in the middle of a night pass, and you work through the whole day, and you get hungry when it's about lunchtime, and then uh, at the end of the day, you start to get a little sleepy-eyed, and, and by the time you're ready for bed, you just fall asleep. And that seems to be independent of the day-night cycles uh, in terms of your orbit around Earth. Excellent. And uh, Sandy Hawkins was curious, what does the ISS smell like? Oh, it smells like a half machine shop, engine room, laboratory, and then when you're cooking dinner and you rip open a pouch, a stew or something, you can, you can uh, uh, smell a little roast beef. <laughs> and um, it was so much fun for all of us on Earth to follow along with you as you grew a zucchini plant on the station. So uh, Joshua Michaels wanted to know, um, do you think we can build greenhouses for food to live in space for long duration missions? Uh, we can. And, and if, you, if you look at the energy balance and the volume and mass required to grow food versus bringing it from Earth, I think uh, for most of the food calories, you're, uh, for, the, for, for the, the next series of, of explorations, uh, you're better off to bring your major food calories from Earth in, in high dense packages. Uh, but raising some food products for, uh, for just as condiments and as, as something to, to perk up the taste buds of the crew, that certainly has value added. So I can see small aeroponic type gardens where, where crew will be raising raising uh, uh, fades just to, to perk up their food a little bit. Interesting. And um, Becky Graham and several of our other readers um, were curious about what kind of dreams you had in space and whether or not they changed in the microgravity environment. Well, th dreams do change. And when I'm on Earth, I dream about being in space. And when you're in space, you dream about walking and being on Earth. And, and maybe it just figures that uh, human beings are never satisfied with uh, where they happen to be, which may be one of the reasons why we have the gumption to go off and explore in the first place. <laughs> and um, Tyler Crichton and William Stack wanted to know, um, with over 300 days in space already under your belt, uh, would you consider participating in a long-duration mission to, say, colonize another planet or moon? And what if there was a chance you couldn't return? Well, I would, I would uh, go back to space in a nanosecond. Uh, I, that's what I do for a living. And uh, give me a, 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 another couple of days here to get my feet on the ground, and I'm ready to go again. Uh, and in terms of immigrating from, spa from Earth, uh, I'd, I'd be willing to immigrate from uh, uh, Earth, uh, immigrate into space, uh, leaving Earth and never come back so long as one, we had the technology so that you could survive. You know, one way missions to Mars where you go there and then run out of air and die, that's, that's, uh, that's not uh, in the cards. Uh, if you went to Mars like people went from continental Europe to the New World, uh, uh, in the, the 17th century. That, that model would be something I would do. I'd, I'd load my family up on the next rocket and, and we'd, we'd immigrate into space. And um, Jay Lewis and Susan Cady were wondering what is the strangest or most fascinating thing you saw from the ISS, either looking into space or looking back at Earth? Uh, well, one of the, the most amazing things is to, to be able to see something like a comet from space. And we saw a, a, a solar eclipse and then the transit of Venus. So there were, were a number of, uh, of fairly rare natural astronomical phenomenology that you could see from Earth. But when you see them from space, the, the vantage is, is slightly different and, and it adds a new twist to it. And it allows you to see the, the, the physics of the, the situation. And, and, and we, we see the, the shadow of the moon as it's cast uh, when it goes between Earth and the sun, and we call that an eclipse. And to be able to see that shadow as a spot on Earth lets you know that, that gosh, these guys that wrote the textbooks uh, figured all of this out without seeing it from this viewpoint. Mm -hmm. 
And finally, to wrap up, uh, Joe Sassiet was uh, wondering how much micrometeor damage does a space station sustain on a yearly basis, and what do the astronauts feel or hear when something like that hits the station? Well, uh, fortunately, we haven't been whacked by something big enough to do any real damage. Uh, the the micrometeorites that do impact station, we, we can't hear them from the inside. And, and they'll impact little structures and make little tiny divots. And, and we have micrometeorite shielding to protect the, the sensitive stuff, the pressure hull and things like that. Uh, you can see uh, results of micrometeorite damage hitting things like handrails and, and other pieces of equipment on the outside of station. And, and when we do a spacewalk, if we see something like that, we'll stop and take a picture of it so engineers on the ground can, can, uh, can uh, take a look at, at what's happening. And it, and it's, it's just something that it's a, it's a continual occurrence. It's like a very uh, small rain, a drizzle, and, and it, it's just something that you have to engineer around when you make a spacecraft. Great. Well, unfortunately, our time is up, but thank you so much for your time, and uh, welcome back to Earth. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure talking. Thanks.